Hello and welcome to the Applied Economics course for Ocean Ain Shamskin program. This is Dr. Wale Talat, lecturer of Economics 8, Faculty of Business, Ain Shams University. The comprehensive content of this topic will be covered in two lectures. This is the first lecture. Lecture number one. Trade strategies. Okay, first I'll give you an overview of the topics we are going to cover and focusing on the main goals, highlighting the some of the issues that we have to think about when I'm just going to hand during the lecture. So this is a somehow comprehensive lecture that starts with the definitions and concepts. As you see, the first bullet point is applied economics, definitions and concepts. We have to understand, well, what do we mean by applied economics and how applied economics is different from any other course you already took. Then we have to move to some of the definitions and other concepts like the, dif the difference between the economic growth and economic development, the difference between the strategy and policy and so forth. And then we are going to move to talk about the trade strategies and development. Do we have different trade strategies or we only have a one trade strategy? So we are going to explore that during the lecture. And finally, we will talk about trade and growth. So now what I'm asking you is to look back a little bit and try to ask yourself, what do we mean by applied economics and how applied economics is different from any other branch of economics and what's new about this course? So in order to understand that, we have to define first what is the applied economics, what is the definition of the applied economics. So first, as I referred to in the previous slide, in order to understand the foundation of the course, we have to understand what does this course mean or the definition of applied economics. So applied economics is the application of economics to measure contemporary real world problems, which means that this involves examining methods or ways to achieve pragmatic and practical goals which require analyzing and making decisions about whether or not the logic of the pure economics you already took in the previous courses, economics courses, macro or microeconomics, were relevant to the contemporary real world problems. So I'm just trying to link the theory with the practical real world problems. So this is the core of the applied economics. So in the examples of the branches of economics is the microeconomics topic is the small firms, pricing decisions, oligopoly, and we have monopoly, we have competition, policies, multinational labor markets, housing, education, environmental economics, a lot of examples in the microeconomics. And we have the topics in the macroeconomics like the public expenditure, taxation, unemployment, inflation, and a lot of other examples as well. So here is the core is how I am just using the theories in the microeconomics and linking it to these different topics about what's going on in the real world. So this bridge, we have to refer it as the applied economics. So what I'm trying to do here is to refresh some of the basic definitions before going to the comprehensive content we are going to illustrate during this lecture. What is the difference between trade strategy and trade policy? The core here is very important to understand the difference when I'm saying trade strategy and trade policy. So the next slide 
we will define the, what is trade strategy and what is trade policy. Well, so what is the difference between trade strategy and trade policy? First, trade strategy. Trade strategy is a long-term plan for achieving objectives. And these objectives, in order to achieve it, you should design trade policies. Therefore, the trade strategy is a long-term plan for achieving objectives using certain trade policies. If I have an example now, the first objective of the trade strategy is to reduce the deficit. So reducing trade deficit is my first objective of the trade strategy. And the second objective is to protect the local industries. In order to achieve those objectives, I should design the trade policy to achieve the trade strategy. So trade policy here, in order to reduce the trade deficit and protect the local industries, for example, I will choose the import substitution trade policy. And to achieve this trade policy, I need some of the instruments to implement this policy. So for example, for the import substitution, I may use the policy in instrument. The first one is the tariff and the second is the quota. So as we see here, the trade strategy is a long term plan with two objectives, for example, reducing trade de deficit and protecting local industries. So in order to achieve these objectives of the trade strategy, I need to use and design trade policies like import substitution policy and to implement this policy I need the policy in instruments and it's according to the trade policy I'm going to choose the policy in instruments and here in our example for the import substitution I'm going to use the tariffs, which mean that I'm going to increase the tariffs here and reducing the quota in order to protect the local industries. And by this action, I'm going to reduce the inputs and henceforth, I'm going to reduce the trade deficit. So wrapping up the trade strategy is a long term plan for achieving objective using the certain trade policies and Trade policy is the courses or principles of action to achieve the objective of the trade strategy. So, for example, we do have a UK trade strategy for 2025. It's called the Construction 2025 strategy, where this strategy is focusing on the industrial sector it sets out the vision and the plan for the uk it's long-term plan as we said the strategy is a long-term plan action and it's by the government to enhance the industrial sector where it focuses on the key growth markets of uh, some of the sectors uh, like the smart technologies green constructions and overseas trade so this is the whole trade strategy for the UK for the construction or the mainly focusing on the industrial sector. So to achieve that, it has a trade policy and trade also policy and instruments. So now we do understand what is the difference between the trade strategy, which is the holistic vision for the government in order to achieve the objective, you should set out the trade policies and setting out or designing the trade policies need to focus on which instruments that can be implemented in order to achieve the holistic vision of the trade strategies and its objectives.
after we understood the definition of the applied economics and we gave some of the examples and then we moved to the difference between the trade strategy and the trade policy and the policy instruments used in the trade policy to achieve the objectives of the trade strategy now we have to distinguish between the economic growth and the economic development we have to understand what do we mean by economic growth and what do we mean by economic development if there is any link between the economic growth and the economic development are these two notions or have the same meanings or they do have a different meanings so we have to differentiate well between economic growth and economic development First, economic growth. An economy is said to grow when its total real output or gross domestic product GDP rises. Per capita GDP is a measure of a country's standard of living. So we, we can get the per capita GDP by dividing the GDP over the number of the population in a certain country. So for a standard of living to rise over time, GDP must grow faster than the population. So the nominator should be growing faster than the denominator, which is the number of the population. So the acceleration of the growth in the GDP should be greater than the number of the population so that we can say the per capita GDP increases, which means that the standard of living is to rise. Second, economic development. Economic development refers to the achievement of a quality of life for the average citizen of a country that is comparable to that enjoyed by the average citizen of a country with a modern economy, such as the U.S. So when I'm talking about economic development, I'm referring to the quality of life, for example, for the average citizen in Egypt, which can be compared to that enjoyed by the average citizen in the US. Therefore, economic development is characterized by high levels of consumption. These high levels of consumption is due to the economic growth that happen within the country. Therefore, when I'm achieving economic development, this economic development will be characterized by these high levels of consumption. When I'm achieving also economic development, I'm having a broad-based educational achievement. I'm having an easy access for schooling. Third is the adequate housing. When I'm talking about economic development, I'm saying that I am achieving an adequate housing for the average citizens, which means I'm trying to avoid the occurrence of those slums in the country. I'm trying to replace those slums areas with the adequate housing, access to the water, access to the clean water for sure, and access for the sanitation. So this is the adequate housing. When I'm achieving economic development, I'm talking about access to high quality of a health care. I'm talking about that the, there is access for the health care for the. Therefore, economic growth is very essential for economic development. So economic growth is the core 
for achieving economic development or achieving a better quality of life for the average citizen. So achieving these goals can come about only after long periods of sustained high levels of economic growth. So we saw that economic growth is essential for economic development. So what is affecting the economic growth? International trade can affect the levels of economic growth of an economy. So international trade pl is playing an important role in achieving the economic growth. With unemployed resources, an increase in export sale will lead to an overall expansion in production and an accompanying fall in the unemployment rate. So international trade allows for the purchase of the capital goods from foreign countries and exposes an economy to technological advances achieved around the globe. These technological advances in a country's import competing sector could, for instance, lead to an overall reduction in the volume of trade of a country. Thus, international trade and economic growth are closely linked. So we have now a link between economic growth, economic development, and what's affecting the economic growth is the international trade. So what we are going to explore in this lecture is the relationship between the trade and growth by briefly considering aspects of the trade and the economic development. And then we will examine how economic growth affects international trade patterns. And finally, we are going to explore additional link between the trade growth and international flows of the factors of production. But before going to this comprehensive topics and content, we have to briefly refer to the next slide diagram as a recapping between the difference of economic growth and economic development. So wrapping up here, we said that economic growth is not same as economic development. Economic growth refers to an increase over time in countries real output of the goods and services measured as, for example, the gross domestic product GDP gross national product GNP, or maybe we measure it using the per capita GDP, the GDP over the number of population, or the per capita GNP, which is the GNP over the number of population. Or maybe we are using another indicators like the per capita income. So economic growth is a relevant metric for progress in developing countries. It's a single dimension. So here is when I'm referring to economic growth, I'm referring to increase in the GDP. When I'm referring to economic growth, I'm just seeing the increase in the investment, capital, labor, wages, or maybe higher incomes. I am looking for the indicators of the unemployment in the country, inflation growth. So as we see here, it's a single dimension when we measure the economic growth. It's very econometrical dimension. We use the quantitative measures. So we track the change in the GDP, we track the change in the GNP, we track the change in the per capita income, we track changes in the investment, capital, labor, wages, higher income, unemployment, inflation, as we see in the diagram. So this is a spontaneous change. So growth is possible without the development. 
So we are focusing on the economic factors when I'm talking about economic growth. However, if we move to the economic development, then it's more relevant to measure of the progress and the quality of life in the developing countries. This is a multidimensional. It looks for the socioeconomic structure of the country. So I'm taking the qualitative measures and the quantitative measures. And in the next lectures, we will differentiate what do we mean by the qualitative and what do we mean by the quantitative and the methods used in both methodologies. So economic development is a gradual. It's not a spontaneous like the economic growth. However, it is a gradual and steady change. So I'm looking for improvement in the quality of life, human development index, access to education and healthcare. So we use a range of variables. As I said, we're using the qualitative and the quantitative measures. So we use the economic and non-economic factors. However, what we have to focus here in economic development that to achieve this economic development growth is a prerequisite. So the, when we have economic growth and we seeking the economic development to enhance the quality of life, this is called the progress improvement in the standard of living which is the intersection area, which means that I already achieved economic growth and I moved to the economic development, focusing on increasing the quality of life, the access of the education, the health care. I'm using a lot of the qualitative and quantitative variables in order to improve the standard of living of the average citizen. So after we distinguish between the economic growth and the economic development, we now know that the, we, we cannot achieve economic development without achieving first the economic growth. So we have to briefly now consider the aspects of the relationship between the trade and economic development. And to understand this relationship, we have to know the various trade strategies. So what are the trade strategies that the countries, different countries, are trying to apply in order to achieve the growth and then achieve the economic development? So trade strategies for economic development. What are the main strategies that the countries are using in order to achieve the economic development? First, we have a primary export led development strategy, or we call it the export promotion strategy. We will understand well, what do we mean by this strategy? And what are the advantages if the country is applying this strategy? And what are the disadvantages of applying this strategy? And then we are going to move to another trade strategy, which is called import substitution strategy or import substitution development strategy. We will understand quite well this strategy first, and then we will see what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages of applying this strategy. And finally, we are going to look for the outward looking development strategy. We will define it and understand well this strategy, and we have to understand what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages of this strategy. first is the primary export-led development strategy or the primary export strategy, trade strategy. 
here I'm focusing on exporting primary goods and there is a difference between the primary goods and the finished goods and intermediary goods so this strategy involves policies designed to exploit natural comparative advantage by increasing production of a few export goods most closely related to the country's resource base so here i'm focusing on exporting my own natural resources to foreign countries which i have abundance in this resource so i have a comparative advantage in that resource so i'm trying to export this resource to the foreign countries so here our country example include colombia for coffee mexico and nigeria for petro petroleum and malaysia for rubber so this is the first trade strategy that focusing on exporting primary goods or exporting the natural comparative advantage that this country has so many developing countries are blessed with abundant resources like the gulf area for example they do have a natural resources the oil or the country is blessed with a substantial amount of the land which is ideal for the production of the uh, export natural resources like the gulf area as i said they are focusing on exporting the oil or the land intensive or the countries which are having abundance in the land they focus their production on the land intensive products so this strategy mainly focus on using this natural resources or the abundance that the country has and increasing its production of this few export goods most closely to the resource base that i already referred to in my examples and exporting them to the foreign con countries in return for manufacturing goods produced elsewhere so here i'm talking about the static gains from this trade strategy where the country is focusing on increasing the standard of living through the primary export trade strategy which will lead to the economic growth in addition to this static gain we have also a several benefits to the primary export led growth first if we don't have a trade so it's quite possible that certain factors will be underutilized or perhaps not used at all for instance without the international trade a country with a large amount of the land cultivated land or the fertile land will not all put in use and this would mean that in the closed economy we would have a production inside the the ppf or the production possibility frontier which is the underuse of my natural resources however if i open the economy and i try to increase the trade with the foreign countries this would encourage more intense use of the existing factors of production that i'm abundant in so this strategy will have some advantages but also have disadvantages now we will look for the advantages of this strategy and the argument against or the disadvantages of applying and designing this strategy so we do understand now the primary export led trade strategy we have to focus now on the advantages if we are going to apply this trade strategy in a country what is the advantages of this trade strategy first this strategy would encourage more intense use of existing or abundant resources and we already illustrated that in the previous slide second it would or it could help attract foreign investment 
So this will increase the inflow of the foreign capital as the foreign firms would allocate itself in the country land uh, abundant resources to help it to expand its export sector. Therefore, the foreign investment might situate in the related sectors that the country have the abundance resources in. And this would lead to economic growth. And in the time of the economic development, if the economic development occurs, other foreign investment might situate also in other sectors and thereby helping to facilitate the development of other industries. Therefore, the inflow of the foreign capital would cause the production possibility frontier or the PPF of the developing country to shift out, which means that a higher level of the production than the existing one. Thirdly, this type of growth might have provide linkage effect or the benefit to other industries as the result of one industry expanding. So when one industry expands, there will be a linkage effect or benefits to other industries. For example, if I have a growth in the large scale mining sector, so I am active in the mining sector, this would encourage the development of the local mining equipment industry because I need these equipments in order to extract the minerals, for example. So this type of effect is known as the linkage effect or the backward linkage. A second type of linkage occur when the development of an export sector leads to the provision or development of economic infrastructure such as the road. We can also relate that nowadays in Egypt we do have a great progress in enhancing our infrastructure in terms of the roads, the rail roads. So we are referring to the developing here of economic infrastructure such as roads, railroads, harbors, telecommunication, electricity. So this development of the infrastructure serves to lower the cost of other industries operating in the country. And henceforth, it will lead to promoting development. So fourthly, if I'm applying the primary expert-led development strategy, trade strategy, I'm going to achieve a higher market share, world share, so it's larger world market and this through expanding the production and achieving economies of scale. Therefore here I'm talking about enhancing the competition, improving competitiveness, where I'm focusing on the my quality itself. I'm improving the quality and lowering the price and this is achieving the economies of scale. So I have a lower average cost, lower average marketing cost, the lower of the uh, raw material cost and then I'm achieving improving in my quality of the uh, product or the intensive base uh, product I'm exporting. Then on, if I'm looking on the advantage of applying this trade strategy on the macro level, I'm looking for a higher growth rate so I will achieve a higher growth rate. This is due to a higher exports, to higher exports from the abundant resource, the natural resource I already have. So this will cause a lower in my unemployment rates because people were going to work and have jobs in this sector and higher inflow of the foreign currency due to the higher exports are already mentioned and which is also a source of the government revenue due to the larger tax revenue. So here I'm focusing on the macro level. If I'm applying this trade strategy, I am achieving a higher growth rate. And finally, I'm looking for the on the socio dimension or the social welfare advantages 
where applying this trade strategy will affect the standard of living as the export will increase and the economic growth will be achieved then i can improve using this growth the quality of life of the individual so better choices quality of life so higher standard of living and due to the higher competition i will have a lower prices and higher income due to the higher growth rate and lower unemployment so this will affect on the social dimension or the quality of life of the individual in the developing countries or in the country which is applying the primary export-led trade strategy so this is all the advantages or most of the advantages if i am applying this strategy after mentioning the advantages of the primary export-led trade strategy many government leaders have been critical of this strategy so here we are going to mention the most disadvantages or the argument again is the primary export-led development strategy first the world market for primary products do not grow fast enough to support this type of development and this is due to the low income elasticity of demand for the raw materials or the primary goods like the agriculture goods and therefore low price elasticity of demand for primary goods so the largest market for primary products are the industrialized countries of the world as these countries grow so does their demand for these primary products but not at the same rate and this is the most critical phrase it's not at the same rate so over time one would expect that primary products would represent a declining share of the industrialized countries imports the second and related problem is that the new technologies that created the synthetic substitutes for primary commodities so these technologies decreases or decline the importance of the primary commodities for example we have like a cotton we have a synthetic cotton so they are trying to by the using new technologies they are trying to create the synthetic cottons as a substitute for the natural cottons or this is a primary commodity so the new technologies now created this substitute for my own natural resource abundance or my own primary commodities comparative advantage I have. Okay, a third and related problem to the primary export-led trade development strategy is the claim that exporters of the primary products face a secular deterioration in the terms of trade and this is argued that over time the price of the primary products export relative to the manufacturing goods will tend to fall over time due to the sluggish demand or over supply which means this fall could occur for either of the two reasons first if demand for primary goods is sluggish in the industrialized countries then there will be downward pressure on the growth of primary product prices second if governments in the developing countries pursue the export expansion policies then supplies of these products will rise on the world market again tending to deflate price so in either events the upshot is that a trend toward deterioration in the terms of trade or the prices suggests that developing countries may enjoy a decreasing share of the gains from the trade
and this is the core of the disadvantages of applying the primary export-led development strategy. Therefore, declining importance of raw materials or the primary goods in production due to advanced technology or the appearance of the new technology that can replace the raw materials or the natural resources that I have abundance in. Another related problem is the usage of the high food safety standards and high environmental standards. These standards represent a barrier as the developing countries like the administrative, technical and other capacities to comply with these requirements or these standards, it will represent a cost incurred in order to comply with these high standards. And henceforth, this compliance with these high standards either the food safety or the environmental high environmental standards will undermine the comparative advantage of developing countries in the products that have an abundance in. And together with the institutional weakness that the developing countries suffer and the compliance cost, this will further marginalize or weaker the developing countries or the economic players who are the small countries or the developing countries, the enterprises and the farmers. And here we can say that the high food safety and environmental standards is considered as a trade barrier for the developing countries. Finally, with the low competitiveness in terms of the quality and prices of the manufacturing goods in the developing countries, primary expert-led export trade strategy would not focus on that manufacturing goods other than the primary goods. So the competitiveness of the manufacturing goods in the developing countries will be lower due to the usage of or focusing on the primary export trade strategy. Well, this figure provides some details on the behavior of the world prices of both oil exporting countries and non-oil exporting countries. And we have here the oil exporting countries and this is the oil develop exporting developing countries. And this is the non-oil exporting countries. This is from 19 this is from 1964 until 19 actually it's here so we are talking about 1994 So this figure show that the world price of those two groups of countries that have behaved very differently over this time as we see the fluctuation is really different over this period of time from 1964 to 1994. So oil exporters have seen three sharp increase in their world prices in 1974 year this area 1974 and 1979 in this area and in 1990 this area the first sharp increase the first two coincided with the two large increase in the petroleum prices engineered by the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries or the OPEC and the third reflected the sharp price in the oil prices at the time that Iraq invaded Kuwait. 
So in the 1980s, between the 1979 and 1990s, increases, oil prices fell sharply, and so too did the world prices of the oil exporters. And this pattern has been repeated since the end of the Gulf War in 1991. So the world prices of the non-oil exporters have shown much less fluctuation and we can see here how much is the fluctuation of the non-oil exporting countries. We will see like a steady fluctuations. There have been two significant downturn as the oil prices increase. Otherwise, the world prices appear to to be quite stable with a slight downturn trend over time to the non-oil exporter countries. So this experience in the, this figure offers some additional insight on the world price debate. And first, if a group of countries have a significant market power over a product that is demanded in the world market, it can improve its world price by restricting the supply. So they will restrict, for example, the supply of the oil in order to enhance or in order to increase the, the price of their natural resources, the oil. So in brief, the world prices of the oil exporting countries have experienced sharp increase, while the non-oil exporter countries have more stable, however, a declining world price when the, the oil prices increase. Here, as we see in this area, we will see that this is a downward trend, and this is due to the increase in the oil prices. Uh, so, the group of countries, as we said, with the market power can improve the world prices by restricting the supply and the declining world prices of the non-oil exporters is more likely due to the policies of the other developing countries, those countries in the OPEC, than to the market conditions in the developed countries. Okay, this is all for today's lecture. Uh, lecture number one, we are going to continue the trade strategies in the next lecture, lecture number two. Thanks for listening. If you have any question, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thanks.